Hey folks, um, welcome to the podcast. Today I spoke with an amazing lady called Seema Adya, who is a space underwriter. Very, very cool. She uh, started at the University of Cambridge, did a degree in natural sciences and then uh, a PhD in satellites, um, looking at astrodynamics and geodesy and some really cool stuff that I don't understand. And uh, she made her way to becoming a space underwriter. Um, and we had an uh, interesting conversation about off-Earth mining, about asteroids, manufacturing in space, and uh, what Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson are all racing to do in space. And then uh, we had a little look at um, the startups and what's going on there. Uh, so really cool, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. Cool, I'm alive. Uh, Seema, thanks very much for coming in. Um, I've been quite looking forward to this podcast for ages because it brings me a bit back to my science days. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and space is really super interesting. Mm-hmm. So how did you get into space, insurance? Oh, and Just completely, if I'm honest, completely randomly. So I was always into space. Growing up, I wanted to be an astronaut. I'm still working on that. It's not, not quite cool. there. But, um, <laughs> uh, I did a degree, then did a PhD in satellite stuff. And then I worked in the UK industry at a place called Kinetic. And while I was there, I was working on a team that were doing reliability analysis for satellites. And so I met some people that worked in the insurance and somehow they, well, I wanted to work in London, which I wasn't at the time. They offered me a job uh, and I moved over. So at first I was doing reliability analysis for satellites. Uh, which was quite related to my background, but quite quickly, I like the people side and the client side. Yeah, yeah. And what's uh, reliability analysis? Well, just looking at the likelihood of different components to fail on a satellite. Fine, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, and then what, what was your degree in then? So my, I did a natural sciences degree at Cambridge, and then I went on to study astrodynamics at UCL, which is the study of man-made objects in space. Nice. Yeah, nice. it was really interesting, actually. I was looking at how uh, sunlight actually affects the orbit of a satellite, and it was in collaboration with... Uh, the Jet Propulsion Labs with NASA. So I was over in California a lot oh, wow. doing that. And it was it was really fun. It was really, really good, actually. Amazing, amazing. And then so you worked in uh, in industry for a little bit yeah. and then went into insurance. Yes, and yeah. it was a complete accident. I had no plans to move. Uh, I was enjoying what I was doing, but uh, this... Uh, I this this came along it was in London it was a startup that I was working for so many things about it appealed um, and then I've just this is what I've done for the last 11 years I've moved companies quite a lot um, but it's it's I never you, you know insurance you grow up just thinking well what you know you don't you think it's probably quite dull you don't really think about it but uh, there's so many interesting parts to it and the way it f- impacts almost everything everything you do so it's actually a really good interesting no, that's super interesting. It's not something that's marketed much at university. No. You don't grow up thinking, I want to be in no, insurance. No, nobody does. Nobody you meet thinks that. Most no. people fall into it and then find they can't get out because it's, yeah. it's they like Well, it. they, they seem it's like solving complex problems mm. and uh, and space certainly is. Yeah. So what, so what does a space underwriter do? Like, well, what are you... So we insure satellites and rockets and there's probably about 200 satellites in orbit that we insure. There's another 50 launches each year that we insure. Uh, so it, there's probably about 50 people in the world that do it. It's quite quite well, niche. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it is very global. So you know, now I've done it for this long. There's a little community of us space underwriters, and we go. Uh, you 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 basically have to look at how likely a rocket is to fail or a satellite is to fail. That's basically right, right. what you do. But to do that, you visit the manufacturers. You learn all about their technology, their missions, what they're trying to achieve, everything new on the satellite. It's quite a detailed process. So you work with a client on one risk for you know six months or a year, or by the time you've finished one, you're working on the next thing with them because they're launching uh, okay. something else. So it's a really close relationship you have with the client. So you get in there while they're developing the yeah. satellite or the rocket or whatever there. Yeah, they start to put the insurance in place. Because of the way the financing works, they often have to have the insurance in place. Okay. So that happens quite early on in the process before everything's necessarily finalised. Nice. So you get to go and meet Elon Musk and yes. Jeff Bezos and whoever else I haven't is met doing. Jeff Bezos yet. I met Elon back in maybe 2000 and 
11, a couple of times, 2009, 2011, before he was quite kind of like the rock star he is now. Yeah, he's like a superstar now. Yeah, he was, I mean, he was, he was great. He would give us a tour of the factory where this Falcon 9s were being developed and he'd know everything inside out and explain it all. Wow. And uh, he really had his vision, which is ultimately to colonize Mars, was there. You don't often sit down and and someone's there talking about how they're going to get to Mars. And all his satellite stuff is you know stepping stones to that to that end goal i think do you think he'll make it he'll make it to mars i think he will actually i mean he's do you think we'll make it to mars bef- in our lifetime depends how long we live um but potentially uh whether we'll be able to get back i don't know <laughs> yeah. uh i mean w- there's a lot a lot has to happen but yeah, yeah. we yeah. i feel like we're at this sort of inflection point where there's some very rich people that are into space and technology investing in it the private sphere has really gone and we're gonna it's for all very quickly gonna happen there's an awful lot of stuff to solve for mars i mean getting into orbit you know humans into orbit private space flight is going to become more common over the next few years there's a lot of people working that and then trips to the moon and then maybe living in space more permanently and then mars will be another step beyond that nice so. but it'll be quite a short time frame do you think uh, so potentially like- i think spacex are planning to send people to mars within the next 10 years i oh, wow. personally find that a bit of a is that threat. a one-way trip um i don't think so i don't uh, <laughs> i don't know he's but planning sh- to send robots and probes and stuff there in yeah, the yeah, next yeah, yeah. few years yeah, and then yeah. humans uh maybe I, I i mean yeah i can't see that many people signing up for a one-way trip although i don't know i, 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 I thought there was some game that. show yeah, there was, wasn't actually, there yeah do you want to go to mars and colonize yeah, and stuff yeah didn't apply for that <laughs> no i didn't apply for that either but with like yeah you can like well i interviewed a girl uh, last week who grows meat in the lab oh, wow. and so with all these things you can just i guess go to mars live in a bubble grow yeah. your meat and i mean so much is happening in lots of different industries all at the same time that will really enable that kind of thing i think radiation is still one of the big problems because mars doesn't have an atmosphere which on earth that's what protects us from a lot of the radiation um you know, and and getting there, the time it will take. There's there's a lot which hasn't been figured out yet, but yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of clever minds are working on it. Yeah, yeah. And then so and then the so the rockets are now reusable, which right? uh, I guess was one obstacle to. Yes. So both SpaceX and uh, Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos's company, are developing reusable rockets. With SpaceX, yeah, we insure those now. Um, we're actually going to see the Falcon Heavy. I'm booked to see it in two weeks' time. Oh, nice. So is yeah. this the new? Uh, well, the Falcon Heavy, it's the first commercial flight. They had one test flight, which is when they launched the Tesla. Um, oh, and wow. that's from Cape Canaveral in Florida. So I'm really looking forward to that. Oh, nice. Yeah, so you get to go good. and watch the launch? Yeah, it's touch wood, because um, they often get delayed, you know, bad wind shear or weather or whatever. And oh, okay, so yeah. So hopefully, hopefully when we're there, it does happen. We are booked to go. And, nice. Yeah. And have they got commercial passengers on that? Oh, no. Uh, yes, sorry, they have satellites. They've got, They've got um, satellites a, a satellite that we're fine. insuring, yeah. Fine, so fine. So SpaceX are planning to take humans later this year, mainly for NASA to start with, but they're going to have spaces for paying private passengers. Uh, so whether that will be... That will be in the next couple of years. They, they did their test, was I think it was in February, uh, where they tested their human-rated dragon capsule with a dummy in it. So they would have had that covered in sensors uh, to be able to look at you know how, how safe it would be for a human so i think they get their rated their human rating is yeah. uh getting there i'd yeah. love to do that yeah well be so you cool. know, it should be a possibility i mean i'm sure it will be yeah, yeah. i mean for, if we live to 100 ish oh definitely and I've the price got... should really drop and you know also virgin galactic are doing the space tourism thing so there's a lot of different what's the space um, so are they doing that already the space tourism again it's a similar time frame i mean virgin yeah. galactic have been working on this for you know, since 2004 or so but it looks like they you know they had the first flight of white knight 2 it's kind of like their plane and then there's a spacecraft which is ejected from that once you're at i think it's 50,000 feet and um the the that should happen in the next couple of years. It's, all, it's always been a couple of years away, but it really feels a bit different because there has <laughs> yeah. actually been humans that have got like pilots and so, you know, not not commercial paying private passengers as yeah, yet, yeah. but uh, yeah, a year or two away now. So all, the, so all the kind of drive and advances from private business rather than government? I mean, uh, the spe- SpaceX 
has been largely uh, supported by NASA, for example. So okay, they've right. given SpaceX large contracts to develop the technology. So since 2011, NASA hasn't had a, a way of getting its own astronauts to the into space. It's been relying on the Soyuz, the Russian um, vehicle. So uh, not right. particularly ideal. So <laughs> they really wanted to develop, develop their own capability and chose to do that through a few different companies, SpaceX being one of them. There's another one called Northrop Grumman and through Boeing and they're giving them large contracts to take cargo to the International Space Station in the future, humans, in the near future, humans as well. So the money is coming, it is private companies doing it, but a lot of the funding is not just private, it's not just the money that's it's coming from NASA. And okay, other fine. Agencies. But then, and then no government sent anyone to the moon for... A yeah. while, right? Yeah. I was reading the other day. Oh yeah, a lot. I mean, there was that all that activity in the '60s. Yeah, and yeah. nothing really. But I think Trump just announced that. Is it in the in the next five years or something? They're going to go back to the moon. So. Oh, did he? The yeah. dark side of the moon. Yeah. Wasn't China? Yeah. Didn't China send something recently. Yes, around around in orbit. So in orbit, yeah. Soon people are gonna. Or, you know, I think I think it is mainly going to be driven by private enterprise though. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the st- states, there's going to be a bit of a you know a space race. I think. The US has woken up to the fact that China's now a big player, India's becoming a bigger player, you know, it's not just the Russians anymore. So there's the there's the sort of space race between the states still, but also now we've got these private entities. As, um, and what's the race? the race? Now, what are they racing to do, is it? Well, to dominate space, I suppose. And no one owns it, right? No one, no one owns it, <laughs> although that also is going to, I mean, there's the truth, I think it's, it, there's the treaty of is it the outer space treaty of 1967 which sort of gives says you know any science or sorry explanation or use of space needs to be in the benefit of everybody so um i think more recently there's been different countries have made different uh, rules but there's no international law i believe at the moment that governs how we can use space so so i could stick a satellite in space with a high high definition camera and i could record or video anyone anywhere in the world I think can't I yeah I mean for certainly for communication satellites you need yeah. to get licenses for frequency bands that you can use but right, for right. an imaging satellite Just... um, yeah there's a, there's no international law to say you can't there's lots of guidelines about yeah. what you need to do to make sure you don't have collisions with other people and you need to provide your data to, but it's more at the guideline stage in the sort of legal yeah. it's a shame like the world can't come together and mm. we can go and do it collectively mm. That, that would be nice. And I think the International Space Station is quite a good example of international collaboration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of money to be made from space and there'll be, you know, private entities that want to exploit that. It's always yeah, yeah. been the way, so... So is this the, the, the off-Earth mining well, stuff? Well, that's that... a big one, certainly. I mean, there's so many near-Earth asteroids, so rich in resources, and there's been a lot of investment in how that can, you know, how, how we can benefit from that. And there's a lot of debate about whether the rights and wrongs and who owns this. So for asteroid mining at the moment, I think uh, a few countries have said that you're allowed to, you know, any money you make from mining an asteroid or the resources are yours and then any future profits or whatever can be yours. But not all countries have done that. The UK hasn't done that yet. And there's no international law that governs that. These are individual countries coming up with their own, you know, regulations and 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 some some I think Luxembourg's offering financial incentives to companies that are developing that expertise, particularly asteroid mining. Amazing. So um, yeah, it's it, but someone again, was saying that there's enough metal in the asteroids above just above Earth to build a skyscraper 600 stories high that covers the whole of the planet or something. Wow, that's in the yeah, that's I mean I think I heard something like 16,000 lo- asteroids sort of accessible, more accessible 16, than the 16,000. Yeah. Wow. And they, you know, just the amount of metal they will contain, the amount of rare precious metals that we need all the time for you know, gadgets like our mobile phones or for um energy saving light bulbs or electric cars, all of this, uh, they're quite they're abundant they're just a little bit far away we just need to get the technology i mean mining technology will be significantly different in space uh, just based on the fact there's no gravity out yeah. there and and all of those things so there's a, a lot a lot a lot to develop and the it's whether the guidelines and the and the law and the frameworks can keep up quickly enough with all that activity so who's so who, so if luxem so someone like luxembourg encouraging businesses to do that 
do they have to be based they have to be based in I Luxembourg I think they have to have some element of ba- yeah being based the in company Luxembourg. can be based in yeah. Luxembourg but the amount of money to be made mining the asteroids would be outstanding I mean yeah if you could develop a way I mean the, the I think I mean one of the main reasons to do it is if as a human race we decide we want to spend more time in space for or live there work there actually it you know be more normal then there's no point building everything from earth because earth's a a really big gravity well the energy to take build everything on earth and take it to space it just isn't going to be feasible so you're really going to need to take the stuff that's already there and then you can create you know all these solar sorry orbiting cities and and moon bases and everything else and fuel you can get fuel from asteroids from water so you can break the water down into the hydrogen and oxygen so liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen could be a rocket fuel and uh, so there's there's every there's it's technologically there's a lot to do but there is an awful lot to make it worth developing that but there are yeah. a lot of people that f- worry about um us interfering with <laughs> the asteroids and think that you know it's pollution it's ruining our you know what right have we got to turn space into this big quarry and just mine it like that and it, it will ruin it I, i'm not sure i agree with that i think well, some, some, maybe some of the asteroids I'll see, there's a couple that are a bit large that we know about and see and they have names and you know, <laughs> they have, they're sort of unique and beautiful and perhaps, yeah, it's not right to go, but there's a lot up there. There's a lot of rocks just whizzing around in space. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, a, but people have st- quite strong views about whether it's right for us to but it's exploit, right. exploit yeah, no, them it's, or not. Yeah. But then the thing with the, with the Earth is that, I don't know what was it, eight billion at the moment of people in yeah. the world. It's only Seems going up. Yeah. It's only going up. Yeah. Um, the natural resources are going down. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've been destroying our planet. So yeah. I guess a good argument is let's live on Earth and let's yeah. manufacture let's and mine. Like a garden of beauty. And, yeah, yeah. And, if we can improve safety. it and yeah, yeah, and the pollution will go down and maybe. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, mining these, the stuff that you were going to get from these asteroids, some, some of that is available at Earth, but it's not easy to mine. It can be quite dangerous and quite toxic. So if you can take that off the Earth, you know, you could mine stuff and bring it back to Earth. I don't think that would be the main uh, use of it, but that would be another use of it. But then you'd find, you know, the price of, let's say you got a whole load of platinum or titanium or whatever, or gold brought it down and you had abundance of it. The prices would, would change very quickly. That's true. That's true. <laughs> But yeah, but you can you can see a, a scenario where we'll just mine asteroids and then the metal will come down maybe, maybe to build yeah. stuff and yeah, it's hugely exciting. I, I, I love work, it. It's amazingly exciting. I worked on a project at Kinetic, so this is before I joined Insurance, and it was a, for the European Space Agency uh, about designing a mission to deflect an asteroid because we thought one was you know we need this capability because you might get a bit of notice if an asteroid's coming towards you won't get that much so you kind of need a plan in place for what you would do and that was in 2005 and things have moved on so much in that time in what what vehicles you'd use to launch what satellites what weight they would need to be to do the science around working out which which asteroids are, are the best so that's happened quite relatively quickly yeah, yeah so i yeah. can see how the st- all the next steps will be very quick amazing the internet's only been around 20 years Wow, that's yeah. just crazy. I know, I was trying to imagine what was um, what the future's going to be. Yeah. I was reading this book called um, uh, Homo Deus, uh-huh. The Sapiens and Homo Deus, and Homo Deus is human gods, and it's talking about the future of okay. mankind and stuff. And, you know, he puts forward the idea that, you know, we're algorithms and we're developing AI, mm-hmm. and they're going to be better al- algorithms than us, and are we just an incubator for the next life form? Yeah. And for interstellar too. space travel, it's probably not humans that are going to be going on such long journeys. It's yeah. going to be... Wow. AI or computers and they're not subject to the same you know they're not as delicate as we are perhaps. and they'll live for, and they'll live forever yeah but it'd be interesting to see what happens yeah I can't even imagine I mean like going to the moon um you know maybe there's going to be like some nice hotel boutique hotel on the moon somewhere and that should be within our lifetimes I think I do whether we'll go I don't know I think our children will go if they want to which yeah, they yeah. currently do want yeah. to so I, do I, do, I think we'll be able to I hopefully we'll be able to go yeah I mean, if there's Definitely so much to the moon, Mars, yeah. uh, you know, further out, maybe not, but yeah, I would think so. But with so yeah, with this, there's so much money to be made in mining these asteroids. Mm-hmm. It feels like, mm. you know, people like Elon Musk will really yeah, and like, the fact push that to... it was reusable technology for these rockets. Um, if the if the I think it still needs to be proven that commercially this is a viable concept and SpaceX are going to make money from reusing. I think that is we're still waiting for that yeah, to yeah, yeah. break sort of to be confirmed. But if we 
think about the point where rockets are just used more like aircraft are so they're reused they're not just thrown away they reused hundreds of times or even more then everything's going to get so much cheaper and that's going to allow all all sorts of other industries so you know tourism like the marriott hotel or just any i'm not naming any in particular but they might suddenly think oh there's you know now it's a plausible business idea and that everything might come together the other interesting thing i was reading about was long-haul uh travel and that might be replaced or you know another way to get there would be using a rocket which takes you to suborbital space and i think is it's again spacex they say they can get anywhere on the earth point to point within an hour wow and so if the cost comes down to equivalent to a flight maybe a business class Mm. flight and you can get to the other side of the world in an hour that will change if it becomes affordable and safe who wouldn't do that that'd be amazing you could work in sydney and live in london yeah it's probably shorter Commute than a lot of like people's commutes at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely, so, definitely. Yeah. I and mean, what the implications of that are to the environment and everything else, there's a lot to think about. But I think that might, I think the demand for it will definitely be there and the technology will be there. So then it's just a case of working out the other pieces, which obviously need to be, need to happen. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll definitely be possible. I love that. Yeah. Are there many like startups in the space <laughs> yes there are a huge number and and more as uh, just for the reason described launches are becoming cheaper satellites are becoming cheaper um there's startups everywhere you see yeah you know, i've heard about some small startups people coming straight out of university and and, and doing startups in the uk and there's uh, but the amount of investment in space from quite serious people serious backed people um are huge so they range from you know relatively small companies to huge companies like OneWeb which is a startup and that's what do they do OneWeb are putting uh hundred so maybe 900 to 1200 satellites in in a, in a sorbit communication satellites and they will they'll wow. be quite small but not that small probably the size of um you know a small fridge for example right, and right. they'll be for they should i think the aim is to uh, provide broadband to the other the rest of the population like the three billion that don't currently have access to the internet in Amazing. africa and other countries uh so to so i mean there's and how far um, how how far in orbit do they put that they are at not not that high so they're at, i think about a thousand kilometers 1200 kilometers so relatively close is it the space stations that say 250 300 it varies a little bit so further out than that but wow. still in what we call low earth orbit low earth orbit fine and then planes are flying at uh, well, they're at sort of, I don't know, 50,000, 70,000 feet, or 30, okay. 000, something like that. 30,000, yeah, 40,000. Yeah, they're yeah, much yeah. lower, yeah. Wow, so we've basically got like a whole, we're cocooned in metal about all of these different... We are, I suppose so, and um, these signals, yeah. <laughs> is, that yeah. Good for, is that good for our health? And uh, I don't think there's anything to suggest it isn't. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. And is it, so is it most, the startups are mostly around satellites and communication? Is that what you're seeing? Uh, no, the asteroid field, the uh, just the, the things like deployable, you know, antennas. There's all tiny little areas of, uh, you know, sort of components for for the satellites. Uh, there's in orbit servicing, so satellites that are up there already, and they need they've run out of fuel, but there's nothing else wrong with them. There's a lot of companies that are working on that problem. Yeah, uh, yeah. debris just cleaning up space. There's there's a lot, you know, there's a, it's a huge area and I think it's probably the fastest growing industry. So, really? Yeah. And it's and it's being funded by so government, space sectors of this world, private mm-hmm. equity and Yeah. I mean there's a lot of this sort of the billionaires race really, with you you know, they're all made they've all made their money doing other things. They've got passion for space and they're billionaires and this is gonna ch- they are gonna change the way we live. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're all doing it. It's crazy. Really interesting. Um, and what about um, is there much being done to communicate with other life forms or uh, <laughs> um, I don't know about there's obviously SETI the search for extraterrestrial intelligence which is this organisation that are constantly looking for signals yeah, from yeah. elsewhere in the universe uh, I don't know how act. I don't know how much more than that is going on but uh, I mean personally there must be other life forms. It's just whether we'll ever meet them. But we're finding more and more uh, habitable uh, planets, planets all yeah, the time. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really nice chat to, to you and you. And uh, maybe we'll do one from space <laughs> next time. <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
Hey folks, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places. Bye.